I want to thank the court for this opportunity to talk about Matt. I feel that I must try to share with you what Matt's life and death have meant to us. It is important that he be revealed to you as a loving, vibrant, kind young man. You need to see him as we do to try and understand our loss. However, I'm not really sure we understand it yet ourselves. Matt would be the very first to say that he was not a perfect child. He made mistakes, but those mistakes hurt no one but himself. Matt experienced many disappointments and many successes. While still in elementary school, he became very interested in the theater where he met many very fine role models. He also began to take an interest in politics and current news events. He was quite adept at understanding complex issues and was equally adept at expressing his opinions on these issues. He had such hopes for the future, his future. He was always anxious for the next step, the next stage of his life to begin. Every new step meant new challenges, new friends, and new experiences. When Dennis and I made the decision to move to Saudi Arabia, the boys were thrilled. There was no American high schools there, so all the students must attend a boarding school following graduation from the ninth grade. Matt and his dad chose an American high school in Switzerland to finish Matt's high school career. He was so excited to see a different part of the world. He thought this would be such a wonderful opportunity to learn about the world, to experience different cultures, learn the languages and history of other countries, not only of the country where he would be living, but also the countries of the other students who would be attending the school. He felt that his experiences could only help him define his future. All of these experiences opened his eyes and heart even more to the differences in people. He knew judging people before knowing them was a waste of an opportunity. He never understood why everyone didn't think that way. He felt there could be nothing better on this earth than another friend. Matt was a good and loyal friend to those who knew him. He was always considerate of their feelings, always there to listen, to share, to give whatever he could. He earned their love and respect just as they earned his. I love him more than I can express in this statement. There aren't enough words to describe how much I love him. He was a soulmate, one of the few people we are fortunate enough to know in our lives that are an extension of ourselves. We shared so much, late night talks, love of movies, theater, books, politics, good food and good conversation. He was my son, my firstborn, and more. He was my friend, my confidant, my constant reminder of how good life can be and how hurtful. I will never understand why anyone would want to hurt Matt, to act with such cruelty, such complete disregard for another human being. It was about 5 a.m. in Saudi Arabia on Tuesday, October 8th, when the call came from the Laramie Hospital advising us of Matt's condition as they knew it. There was an 11-hour time difference between Laramie and Saudi Arabia. Every time we could get a call at such an odd hour, my first reaction would be a silent prayer. Please, God, let Matt be all right. This call, he was not. We began an eternal wait to get to Fort Collins, where they had sent Matt. We hoped and prayed he would recover from his injuries. We knew he was critically injured and that his hold on life was tenuous at best, but we still hoped. Our highest hope was Matt's complete recovery. Our most basic hope was that he would hold on until we could get there. We left Saudi Arabia on the first available flight, 19 hours after receiving the initial call. The trip seemed to last for days. A six-hour flight, a six-hour layover, an eight-hour flight, a two-hour layover, a 90-minute flight, a 90-minute drive to Fort Collins, a 25-hour trip after waiting 19 hours to begin. It seemed an eternity, an eternity of not knowing if Matt was even still alive. We were unable to check on his condition once we began to travel. And when I would think of Matt, the image that would come to mind was Matt alone in the prairie and tied to a fence. When we arrived in Fort Collins late afternoon on Friday the 9th, we were escorted into Matt's room. What we found was a motionless, unaware young man with his head swathed in bandages and tubes everywhere enabling the body to hold on to life. We heard the machine helping him breathe. We saw the screens monitoring his various vital signs, his face swollen and covered with stitches. 
His right ear had been stitched and was still oozing. I wasn't even sure that this was Matt. When we approached the bed, I saw that it was indeed Matt. I could tell by the cute little bump that was on the top of his left ear. One of his eyes was partially opened, and I could see the clear blue color. And who could mistake those long black lashes? But the twinkle of life wasn't there anymore. And those braces, I could see his teeth clenching the tubes. Those braces were unmistakably Matt's. We kissed his face, stroked his arms, held his hands and talked to him. I so desperately wanted him to know we were there. There was some kind of response. He began to shake and his arms and legs went rigid. We thought maybe he was aware of our presence, but no, it was an involuntary response to the touching. I was thinking, how could anyone feel so threatened? By this tiny, sweet child, that they would do this to him, such an act of cruelty as incomprehensible. Logan, Matt's younger brother, refused to go into the room at first. He didn't want that image of Matt to be the one that would appear when he would think of his brother. He wanted the smiling, laughing, bright-eyed, handsome young face to come to mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> long, however, before he realized that this was probably the last opportunity. He would have to say goodbye. His last chance to say, I love you. I'll never forget that look of terror on his face when he first saw Matt. He was trembling. The tears were streaming down his face. He went over to the bed picked up Matt's hand and put it on his cheek. He asked us if he could be alone with Matt. So we left the room, but kept an eye on him using the monitor at the nurse's station. We had to make sure he was okay. We were talking to Matt and stroking his face while holding his hand. We were all painfully aware that Matt would never wake up. We spent the next two days with Matt various relatives and family friends, and friends of Matt's had come to be with us. Sunday night, shortly after having left the hospital and close to midnight, we received a call from the hospital telling us we needed to return immediately. When we got to Matt's room, we were joined by friends and other members of the family. We circled Matt's bed, each of us trying to touch him, to hold on to keep him with us, each of us thinking we need more time. At 12.53 a.m. Monday, October 12th, Matt was no longer with us. We joined hands, wept, prayed over him, and for ourselves. There was a kind of relief that Matt was no longer suffering, but also a realization that our suffering was just beginning. We knew, of course, that the two men and their girlfriends had been arrested and were in custody. They gave us an immense sense of hope and that those responsible for Matt's death would receive due process and would be punished accordingly. And what would our lives be like now without Matt? Logan had planned to attend the University of Wyoming. He and Matt were planning to live together. Both were looking forward to the time they would spend together. That hope was killed. All our hopes for Matt were killed. All the hopes and dreams that were Matt's were killed for $20 and some twisted reason known only to his killers. While Matt was in the hospital, many people concerned about Matt began to send money to help defray medical costs. 
as a family, we decided we would rather take this money and try to make something positive come from something so completely devoid of humanity. We had started the Matthew Shepard Foundation and are hoping it will be helpful in encouraging acceptance and embracing diversity in what is one way we can honor our son. 28 days after we received the call in Saudi Arabia telling us about Matt, I had to make another call. Dennis had returned to work while I was staying in my to work on the foundation. November 4th, I had to call Dennis to tell him his father had died unexpectedly. It appeared that stress had been a contributing factor. I think watching him die and knowing there was nothing Knowing there was nothing he could do to help his grandson or his son must have been hell on earth for him. Now Dennis has lost his father and his eldest son. He also lost an uncle who died of a massive coronary while attending Matt's funeral. How have our lives changed? I can't answer that yet. I know personally that there is a hole in my existence. I will never again experience Matt's laugh, his wonderful hugs, his stories, hear about his ambitions for the future. There are days when I think I can't go on, but then I remember Logan and Dennis, other members of our family and our wonderful friends. I know their love and support will sustain me. I know Matt would be very disappointed in me if I gave up. He would be disappointed in us all if we gave up. I have been told, Mr. Henderson, that I can address you directly. I've debated whether or not to do so. I don't think you are worthy of an acknowledgement of your existence, but we all know you do exist. You murdered my son. You have forever changed our family. I hope you won't, we won't allow you to kill us as well. And my hopes for you are simple. I hope you never experience a day or night without feeling the terror, humiliation, helplessness, the hopelessness that my son felt that night. I want you to understand that the decisions you made and the actions you took have done this to you and to your family. None of us would be here today going through this agony if it weren't for you. <laughs>